you know, so I'm, I'm actually going to start this a little bit early. With, there's a lot of material to cover here. So I'm, I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, my name is Larry Woodman. I'm one of the engineers in the, uh, the kernel and memory management group under Perry and Denise in you know, our organization. And this presentation, um, is, it's, it, there's a lot of material to cover, and it's hard to streamline it so it's really easy to follow. And the second thing I was going to say is that there was another fellow who has worked in the performance group who was going to come in here and help me do this, and he had to bail out. He had a medical situation, so he couldn't come. And then my final um, disclaimer is I've caught the Bruno plague, so you're in here at your own risk. You might get it and die just like I might. So, um, so uh, let's see. Okay, so the, in terms of uh, what I'm going to cover here, um, but it's going to talk about um, the evolution of RHEL from 5, 6, 7, and 8. We have customers that run all versions. We have customers that run all versions. And as far as tuning is concerned, over the, over the past, I've been at Red Hat for like 17 years, and it started out obviously earlier than RHEL 5. But uh, it, the tuning has really evolved quite nicely. Uh, it used to be really cumbersome to tune the system. And uh, just like when the previous discussion, the previous louder, okay, the previous uh, um, presentation when Wayman talked about the CPU C groups, all the C groups, some of this stuff is pretty. Uh, the interface is pretty strange. It's hard to sometimes wrap your head around it. And the same thing is true for tuning the whole system. And the two are sort of converging together. Um, CPU. C groups V2 will sort of converge so that you can manage C groups just like you manage the whole system. It's, it's taking time to evolve. It's becoming more automatic, but it, it actually is happening. And then as far as other things, I'm going to talk about TuneD. The, the TuneD is our mechanism to automate some of the tuning, so you don't have to turn all kinds of knobs yourself. Um, some of the more tunable aspects of the system are the NUMA, the NUMA aspects of the system. You make it, it can get a big performance difference on doing the right thing with NUMA versus doing the wrong thing. And I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about latency versus throughput. Um, some a couple of tools that we use. Uh, huge pages. Huge pages is another big uh, performance boost if you use them right in the right situations. You get a big boost if you use them wrong. You get a big loss. And then I'm going to talk about how 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 the kernel tuning uses some of the features that Wayman talked about in the, the CPU, in the C groups themselves. Talk a little bit about disk and file system I.O. performance, just a little bit because I'm not an expert there. And then a little bit of a sneak peek in terms of what we did, what we have going on in RHEL 8. Um, so this is just the evolution from RHEL 5, 6, 7, and 8. The, like I said, the, um, the, in the earlier versions, the um, features were sort of elementary, so you could really only pin stuff in NUMA. There was no automation involved at all. And then as we migrated from 5 to 6, 7 and 8, it became more and more automatic all the time. It gets to the point now where um, you can pretty much install a system and choose what we call a TuneD profile, and it's going to be real close to what you, what you really need. You don't have to go back and adjust all the knobs and all kinds of stuff. Although there are cases in which if you want optimal performance, you, you need to do that, and that's what I'm going to talk about here, and, and talk about some of the features that you can do. Um, so in terms of latency versus throughput, um, I didn't come up with this slide. Throughput is obviously just getting the maximum amount of work out of the system, where latency is almost a measurement of how quickly you can respond to events. And the two are often mutually exclusive when it comes to uh, the kernel tuning. Uh, a write-back cache, for instance, the page cache is a write-back cache, and if you adjust the parameters in one way, it's a very high throughput system. It, it really wails when it comes to minimizing doing disk I/O and and all that. But what happens if you if you run off the edge, you pay the price, you can get a really high latency spike. So that's not acceptable to some people, some customers. So we have profiles that actually uh, make trade-offs between latency and throughput. So TuneD, um, this, this is just a set of slides that I grabbed out of some other set. It's, it's in, you can install a default TuneD profile for a database server. And, and it used to be just a database. There was only a handful of them at one time. But it's, we have a fairly rich um, TuneD profile library now. So you can 
actually take your system and find a profile that closely, fairly closely matches your system and your workload, apply it, and it's going to be real close to optimal performance there. Once again, like I said, if, if you want the system to be very high throughput, you're going to have to trade off some latency and vice versa. Um, so the, so the, um, the 2D profiles are actually hierarchical, so you start with one and you can actually you can actually micro tune different pieces in it, and I'll show you. I'll get some examples of this toward the end of this presentation. So here's an example of uh, like a throughput versus a latency. Um, the I, I had said before that the uh, um, the the tuning parameters that control the write back effective or behavior of like the page cache control directly control uh, latency versus throughput. In this VM dirty ratio. They're different. So VM dirty ratio on throughput says, don't do a whole hell of a lot until you're dirty like 40% of the memory in the page cache. And what that does is it allows other mechanisms to kick in and start flicking pages back to disk. So you basically never have to do anything and the system just sort of takes care of it. The problem is, is if you let all that memory get dirty and you do all of a sudden throw a workload at it and, and it needs to start doing a lot of disk I.O., it's going to stop. It's going to stop the processes and it's going to stop writing them out and those processes are going to incur high latency spikes. And that's undesirable for a lot of workloads, high, <coughs> high um, speed trading and so forth, or closer to real-time systems. So I'll, I'll talk about some of these. I actually talk about these parameters on, in the TuneD profiles and the ones that you <coughs> most likely need to tweak. So this is just an example I took from one of the performance guys. They, this is the, the performance difference on picking, uh, on picking a profile that matches the workload, that you get a, a significant um, performance boost on, by, by applying the correct TuneD profile versus the default. In this particular case, I don't even remember exactly what this is. This was um, some uh, I, 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 I O operations per second, and you can see that picking the right one makes a big difference in, in performance. So the, the next, the, the first piece I want to talk about that is probably the most most effective tuning mechanism we have is the NUMA system. Non-uniform memory access is the system is built with a set of building blocks, CPUs, RAM, and then um, some local DMA access and some links between the between the nodes. So if you, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about, about what Wayman was talking about here. In, an, in a NUMA node, if you successfully bind the CPUs and the memory to the same node, it's going to run a lot faster than if you unsuccessfully do that. And I'll show you how, the, the, how we do that. So this, this is just an example of of something that isn't really properly tuned right. It isn't the, the placement of threads, tasks, and memory are not all in unison. And they're, they're incorrect, and what's going to happen is it's going to run at a slower rate. And then uh, what happens is we have, a, we have multiple mechanisms that actually move either memory, they either re relocate memory or they relocate threads and tasks to other CPUs to align the memory reference to be local versus remote. So this is just a, uh, an automation where we, we showed what would happen as, these, uh, um, as the system moves the uh, processes from one new node to the other so that it's aligned with the memory. Um, the, these are tools to display um, CPU and memory. So LSCPU will, will tell you the architecture. It will tell you how, big, how many CPUs are in each node, the amount of memory in each node, and these are just the, the, the rudimentary tools. There's several of them to help you, to help the whoever is doing tuning. Most of, most of the time, you do this level of tuning for some high performance benchmarks. You wouldn't probably, you'd probably let the system do most of the work for you, especially in a later system. If you go back to like a RHEL 5 or a RHEL 6, it doesn't work as well, so you have to do more manual tuning. But as the systems have evolved, the, the kernel has evolved, it gets a lot better. So this, um, this just, the uh, NUMA CTL minus minus hardware is another one. This will tell you the, the nodes, it'll tell you the CPUs on the node, it'll tell you the memory sizes, and it'll tell you some information about where the memory is. Um, LS Topo is a, uh, a pictorial view of the same thing. 
Um, so we have, um, like I said before, we have, as, as the system has evolved, we, in earlier systems, you, see, you used to have to do a lot of this manually. You, have to, you used to have to go in there and use bind to bind CPUs, to bind processes to CPUs and memory <coughs> locations and all that to minimize the, the remote memory access. But as, as the system has evolved from RHEL 6, 7, and 8, it becomes much more efficient. It does it automatically. And it doesn't have pathological. When, when we first started developing this, it's hard to eliminate a bunch of pathological conditions in which we're constantly moving stuff around. We've gotten a lot better at that. So the picture at the top just shows if you have, um, like, on each node, you have four processes or four um, virtual machines running, and they're scattered all over the place. <coughs> It's not aligned properly. <coughs> and then you can see down the bottom, after the system moves everything and makes sure that the memory is in CPUs or local, uh, then, then they're basically on node one, this, the first uh, um, QEMU is only running on node one. It's not making a bunch of cross memory references. And this has a big performance boost when you do that. So, so techniques for, for placement, like I said, early ones you used to have to combine it. You used to have to. And you see, people still do, if you're doing really optimal, th there's no solution for a sledgehammer, so to speak. So there's no, I'm sorry, there's no replacement for a sledgehammer. If you want the system to really make sure that you have local memory accesses, then you, uh, you go and you bind everything. It's a lot of work, though. It's a lot of manual work, and it just really doesn't, it, it is, isn't necessary as the systems have evolved. Tasks that... Um, this is this you can do this programmatically. Sked, get and set affinity, M bind. This is all. These are all system calls that allow you to change your code to bind stuff together. And this is what you used to have to do in the earlier version in order to get this stuff to work right. And then finally, the piece down the bottom is C, is C groups. The uh, one of the, the the way that the that some of the tools that we have that migrate processes around, they actually use C groups. They use CPU C groups and there's a, um, a user program called Numad. It's just a daemon that runs around and it looks at the, at the memory and where it looks at the CPUs, the memory, and the, where the references are taking place. And if they're cross-referenced, they're not local, it moves them. It actually echoes, just like um, Wayman said, it echoes the, the PID into <coughs> another, another memory C group and then that migrates the task over there so that you have memory and CPU in the same node. So these are the two, the uh, um, NUMA-D. We still support NUMA-D, although it's not as necessary um, in, um, because of the inside the kernel. So NUMA-D uses CPU C groups. It moves stuff around and it monitors these C groups and to, to figure out if it should adjust stuff. But inside the kernel, we have a NUMA auto-balancing scheduler, and it does not use C groups. It uses the internal kernel data structures to figure out if it should move processes around and, and so forth. It works a lot, it's a lot more efficient. It doesn't rely on user code running, it's faster. Um, and, and over time, it has gotten a lot more effective. It, early versions of it had some pathological cases in which it would move stuff around more excessively than it should. And it, um, <coughs> there's a video in here, you can watch how it works. So this is just a, um, a uh, picture of if, if you, do this correctly, you can see that um, the ba new balancing on versus off, and this is the elapsed time. Obviously, lower is better. So if the new balancing code is on, moves stuff around, it does it does the right thing. You get better performance. So in terms of the internals of the kernel itself, so the the kernel itself maintains um, some kernel data structures, um, zones, and nodes. So the way that it works is node zero contains all the memory from location zero up to the size of the node. So it contains a few other zones. We have zones of memory for that are less than 60 megabytes and less than 4 gigabytes. These are for older devices that are legacy ISA and ESA devices. And then this normal zone is what the majority of the memory is. Most, new, most systems now have many, many gigabytes of RAM in a given NUMA node. So the, I couldn't really expand this, but if you could expand this to really look like it should, these two pieces are really small toward the bottom. They just it was difficult to, to get them all on one page. And as far as the um, as far as the kernel data structures and algorithms are concerned, each NUMA node has its own 
memory reflame demon. It has its, all of its own algorithms and demons. So this is basically the paging, page reclaim dynamics and how you, um, this stuff, they, so on each NUMA node there is a, uh, a kernel thread called KSWAPD and its job is to balance everything within that node. And so when you run on a NUMA system you have two, you have multiple independent memory reclaims taking place. And, and because of that, you can actually run VM stat and have a, a lot of free memory and notice the system's reclaiming memory at the same time. And the reason for that is because um, one of the NUMA nodes, the free memory might be depleted where another one, other one it's not. So, but if you run a tool like VM stat, it shows you your total summation of memory. So that is a normal situation to run into. Um, so I just want to talk about the interaction between some of the VM tunables. These are the ones that you're going to see in the NUMA, in, in the TuneD profiles. <laughs> These are the ones that are most commonly adjusted in the profiles and the ones that you're most likely to have to adjust if you want to really fine tune or hone in on some tune, tuning. The ones that are dependent on the, the uh, NUMA on the NUMA system of the, these reclaim ratios, swapping is min free k bytes and zone reclaim mode. And then the ones that are system wide, they're independent, are the cache pressure, the dirty background ratio, and the read ahead. And these are the ones that Wayman talked about. They'll be, these will be in um, uh, V2 C groups, like the, especially the, the background ratio and the dirty ratio, right? Yes. So. This is what the white background color is about. Yep, right. So, like, like I said before, it's kind of an arcane, the tuning Linux is kind of an arcane system. It's, you, you use the proc file system and the, C, and the sys file system to go in there, and there are files in there. One of the files is proc sys vm swappiness, and this controls how aggressively the system reclaims memory from either anonymous, the anonymous pool or the page cache pool. And the min free k bytes determines how much memory it keeps free, the zone reclaim mode, I'll talk about that. Um, that that's a really big hammer that, that uh, the upstream kernel has turned on and off over the last several years anyways. I think it's disabled by default now because I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as we get there. Um, swappiness, like I said, swappiness controls how aggressively the system reclaims memory from the page cache versus the anonymous memory. Um, so the default is 60. It is, it is the percentage. It's just an integer from 0 to 100. They set the default to 60. And what this does is it um, controls when the system runs out of memory how aggressively the system tries to reclaim page cache memory versus anonymous memory. If you decrease it down to, like we saw those Tundi profiles, decreased it way down by 10, it will more aggressively reclaim the page cache memory. So on a, on a database system, you don't want the system to swap because it's going to try to write the anonymous memory back to swap space, and that's, a, that's an undesirable thing to do. So you'll see the 2D profiles adjust this to a lower value. If you increase it, it will more aggressively reclaim anonymous memory and swap. There are applications that you want this to happen, but the, the majority of them, you don't. <coughs> this can, these, and like I said, these, until we get to C group V2, these are global, they're, they're global, they, they don't, they, <coughs> they control the whole system. Um, it's, and once again, it's not as necessary to tune the later systems as it is the older. So the, um, the, just to explain like the, the, the most common things you'll adjust, the memory reclaim watermarks, there are three, three watermarks, pages, high, low, and min, um, when, so when the system boots, all the memory goes on the free list and it very rapidly depletes the free list. It uses all the RAM to cache every file in the world and into the page cache. And then the system immediately ends, ends up running a memory deficit mode. So and, and when, the, when you're above this page is high, which is a very small number, it's significantly less than 1% of the RAM on, a, uh, uh, on the NUMA node. When you're above this page is high, um, the uh, case swap that doesn't do anything, it just sleeps, the, the, it, it does absolutely nothing. And then as the free list gets depleted further and further down, it goes below low. Every time you allocate a page of memory, it does a wake up to case swap day. And it runs in the background, it's high priority, runs in the background and trickles pages out and reclaims them. Once again, it typically doesn't swap, it reclaims page back pages because the system is tuned to do that. 
And then if you push it all the way down to min, you overwhelm. There's only one case swapped in a human node, and you have, have thousands of user processes running. So you could overwhelm it, even though it's a higher priority kernel thread. So when this happens, um, you can get down to pages min, and when that happens, every process becomes case swapped. -y. So it just says, screw it, you can't have anything until you reclaim memory and help the system. So this is the way that the whole thing is designed. And when you, so the setting of min-free k bytes, that min-free k bytes parameter that I talked about, controls, let's see if I can, oh, I don't know this, oh, controls this. So if you increase it, that increases the, the number of, the number of free bytes on the system. And if you increase the bottom, it scales all of them up accordingly. So the distance between pages min and zero is the same as pages low and high. And it's actually 2x that and then 4x to pages high. So the system, so what this does, what this does by the way, is it is when the system runs out of memory, it, de it determines how drastic the cliff is that you've the performance clip is that you fall off the, when, the, when the system runs out of memory. If, it, if you set it really low, then it's not going to keep much free memory around. And it's not going to do, it's basically going to be a high throughput instance. That's why you'd see that in a high throughput instance, it would lower this. And then if you fall off the edge of that, it's going to, the, the performance clip is really steep. Whereas if you increase pages min, the, it's going to, keep a whole bunch of free memory around. You don't want, to have, want it to be very big because free memory is like removing memory from the system. But, <coughs> but it, um, it, in other words, it won't use it to cache the contents of file systems. So, um, it, so this is a trade-off between throughput and performance, just like I had, had talked about before. Um, so this is, this is just I, to show you what happens, is min free k bytes. It's, I just chose a system that was in our lab in a, uh, a two-node system, and I just catted it out. And then if I echoed, um, I doubled the size. You can see basically double all of the, of the parameters in between. This, this, is a, this isn't a desirable thing to do unless you really are sensitive about um, the performance clip that you run, up, run into when you fall off the, off the edge because it is effectively removing memory from your system. So we've had customers that have gone in here and said, um, I, I want, I want I bought the memory, I want it free. So they, they'll increase this to some, <coughs> excuse me, some massive value in the performance will really suck. It'll just, it, it runs with a, a, a fraction of the memory that it should have. So, um, so, so we basically tell people not to mess with this thing very much at all unless they have a really latency, high memory hog latency sensitive application that they're running. Um, zone reclaim mode is when, the, so there's a couple of criti critical decisions the kernel has to make when it comes to reclaiming memory. We talked about the NUMA, um, <coughs> NUMA nodes in cross-memory references. When you run out of memory on a node, you basically have two decisions. You can either go off, spill onto another node, and allocate the memory there and start doing cross-memory references, or you can force the system to reclaim memory on that node and not impact the other ones so that, the, so that you're making local memory references versus remote. Um, it's a trade-off between uh, the program's startup time and its performance as it runs. If you, if the system, if the system uh, is, if you tune it with this zone reclaim mode to, to reclaim on the local node, on the local memory node, it's going to, it's going to impact how fast the program starts up. But once it's up and running, it's going to be doing all local memory references, so it's going to run faster as it, as it, um, as it runs. Yeah, like I said, this is a fairly arcane uh, parameter. It's a pretty big hammer. You can either switch it one way or switch it the other. We're still working on refining this and, and getting it right. This has been actually turned on and off a couple times over the past couple of years in the upstream kernel. Somebody, Somebody will uh, post a patch that said, I want to turn it on because when the system runs out of memory, I want it to reclaim local memory. That could be a real performance problem, though, if, the, if, it's, if you're really overwhelming the system. So, they, so by default, the upstream kernel in RHEL 8 and RHEL 7 have, a, have it all turned off now. And if you want to get a, a higher running, a faster running program, and you're willing to pay the price at startup time, this is this parameter has changed in the new D profile, and you can mess with it yourself. So this is just is just another um, uh, um, 
slide that I found out in the performance slide <laughs> that if it's if when the, if if this thing is turned on and it runs and it starts reclaiming memory in the local node, you get a lot of uh, um, high you get high latency spikes because rather than just jumping onto another node and sucking the memory off of there and dealing with the remote memory accesses, which is what you would do if you are if you are trying to achieve a low latency <coughs> profile. Um, it would reclaim on that node, and it would run faster, but it would take longer to fire the program up and run. So it's a, it's a trade-off. Once again, this is another one. Uh, oh, this is the NUMA, um, the auto NUMA balancing uh, that, that takes place. You can see there's a big difference on enable. This is all, by the way, this is all tunable too, and I, <coughs> tuning profiles mess around with this. But if you unless you read the tuning guide and really know what you're doing, you want to be careful messing around stuff because you can really you can really mess the performance up if you do this so but you can see if it's on there are applications or there are there are two d profiles that disable the auto numa so it doesn't move anything it's just whatever you wherever the program landed when it started up it stays there for the month of the program and there are applications there are database applications and so forth that run better like that because their their memory footprint might be larger than a a given single NUMA node, and it can spend a lot of time chasing its tail, trying to move um, pages and of memory around in order to optimize the performance. So there are tuned D profiles that shut this off. I just wanted to say that. So just in terms of latency versus throughput, uh, um, this is just uh, let's see. Um, so one of, one of the things that one of the parameters that uh, that controls latency is also the no hertz full. This, what happens is in a, uh, on the default system, what would happen is like every 1,000 times a second, whatever we set hertz to, you would incur an interrupt, a timer interrupt, and the timer interrupt service routine would say, do I have anything to do? No, I don't. Go back to sleep. But one time out of, uh, one, one or two times say out of 100, it will actually have work to do. So it will, you know, trigger some timer events or reschedule or whatever is necessary. So what, <coughs> what, what we've done is to, rather than, rather than waking up a thousand times a second, when we insert something on the timer queue, we figure out how far in the future we have to wake up, and then wake up only when that amount of time has gone by. We never interrupt the CPU or the clock interrupt. The downside of doing that is, <coughs> is you, your latency is higher. If you have some external event, the granularity of the timer is coarser if you have some external event that uh, is you need to uh, uh, you need to catch if it's more of a real-time system <coughs> you it's you're not going to catch it you may not catch it in time but the downsides of ticking every a thousand times a second is it it's a nice cash flush routine every time it runs it dumps part of the cash on the floor and you have to fault the whole thing back in so it's through it's throughput is lower but its latency is also lower um, and this is just a picture of the tick list. So in other words, rather than ticking a thousand times a second, if you don't need to, it basically sets the, the timer interrupt to go off in the future ones when, when it's necessary. But once again, the schedule is not going to, the schedule's granularity is coarser and it's not going to do everything that it potentially should have done. So just a little bit of performance tools. We have, there was a couple of talks yesterday and uh, um, on, the, on PERF. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, the perf utility allows you to zoom in and see what the system is doing. So if you have a system that goes, uh, I just made something, it goes to a real high system time, you say, what the hell is this thing doing? You can run perf on the system, a perf top, and it will basically tell you, it will zoom right in on what's going on here. So it's not necessarily useful to people unless they, if you're trying to profile the kernel, you have to understand the kernel to understand what various routines are doing. So say for instance, uh, it's spending a lot of time reclaiming memory or something like that. You're gonna see some of the case swap key routines and memory reclaim routines way at the top in the red zone. And that would be indicative of an issue that you need to adjust some of the 
memory uh, parameters, uh, and we we documented a lot of the, a lot of this. We have some good tuning guides. It's not really possible to go out through, the, through everything here. There's just too much of it. We have some good tuning guides to tell you how to do this and how to, how to set the systems up and how to how to adjust the parameters, how to zoom in and look for what's going on. Perf record is is another, so perf has several features. It has perf top, it's perf, it's perf record allows you to basically rather than updating the if you just run perf top, it's on top every second. It'll tell you what the fastest what the routines that are spending the most time. It's like throwing like a thousand dots at the system, and then uh, every every second it'll tell you which subroutine incurred the highest number of dot hits, and. Uh, that's, that can be really difficult to, if you're trying to really get an idea of what's going on. Perf top can be really difficult to, to trace through. So perf record records it, and then you can go and play it back in in the background and figure out what was going on for the duration of that. It's got a fairly low overhead. I don't know. I guess uh, your your would know more about the overhead than I than I do. We use this all the time. You get a system that's running, it's doing some weird stuff. Spin locks and so forth are big hits when it comes to, to this. We use this to determine hot locks and bad caching techniques and so forth. Um, and then perf, so perf, perf record creates a file and then perf report opens the file and then prints it out for you. And you can, it collects all the data just as if you're doing a perf top, but then you can go back and say, let me see what happened between seconds five and 20 in a little give you a, a distribution of where the system spent its time and a very useful tool in terms of figuring out how it's going on. <coughs> um, yeah. uh, this, this is just another um, one, of the, one of the options that uh, I didn't spend much time here. The other guy that was going to help me do this had more verbiage on this and he works with it more. He's in the performance group so I just uh, left this in here. So the next, the next area of tuning the system that has a big, a big impact is page size. The Intel architecture supports 4K, 2 meg, and 1 gig pages. And if you um, use a, a TLD entry, um, maps a single TLD entry maps a page. It either maps 4 megabytes, um, 4, 4 kilobytes, 2 megabytes, or 1 gigabyte. So the bigger, the larger the page size you can use, the fewer the TLD versions you're going to get. So this really impacts how how fast, how how this really minimizes the TLD misses. The downside is though is if you have a a large um, sparse virtual address space and you touch one byte, if it's if you're using two megabyte pages, it instantiates two megabytes right then and there instead of 4K. So if you're depending on the application that you're running in the memory. In, in the memory, uh, the virtual memory region that you're in, you might want to enable or disable huge pages in there because it will, uh, when it allocates a page, it's going to zero the thing out and map it in so that the, the startup time is high and the, the memory footprint is much, <laughs> typically much larger in a sparse, sparse address space because it's using larger amounts of pages. So this is just a picture of, of how it works. The, the TLB, like I said, a given TLB entry maps either 4K, 2 meg, or 1 gig, and you can enable and disable these things on the fly. So we have something called transparent huge pages. So huge pages come in a few different flavors. The conventional um, huge pages that are used for system five shared memory are, um, are um, um, basically use a meta file, and they these pages are you have to sort of set the system up or tune it to use these things to begin with. Where transparent huge pages are used for um, anonymous memory, and they're also used in the page cache in LA, that we're, we're using more of these things in page cache. Um, but it, as you can see here, is if, if, you, if you, I just wrote this really stupid program that danced in memory, and I, if I turn <coughs> off transparent huge pages, echo never into sys, this is, like I said, this stuff is arcane. It's kind of a weird way to do it, but it's the way the whole system is tuning is done. <coughs> if I disable uh, transparent huge pages, you can see that the system runs. It took it took 12 seconds instead of seven seconds to run. So it's a big performance hit on, on doing that. Um, so yeah, you can see there's a speed up of 1.7, you know, 77% 7, speed up. The problem is, or 56%. The problem is. 
with the speed up, if it's a, like I said, if it was a sparse address space, it's going to suck down a lot more memory and get the system into a page reclaim state even sooner. So this is how the two megabyte standard huge pages are used for system five shared memory. It just so they just have an example in there. You echo two thousand of them into um, Proxys VM on our, in our huge pages, and when you do that, the system the, by default the system will round robin through all the NUMA nodes, so you get an even distribution through the NUMA nodes, um, and then you run a program that uses them. You can see in the uh, in Procman info that it actually used them and uh, you get a, a performance boost accordingly. Um, it, th th there, there are times in which you might not want the system to round robin, but you do, rather than scattering it through all of the NUMA nodes, you want to bind a, uh, a program to a NUMA node. You, do that, you don't do that through the PROC file system, you do it through the SYS file system. So you can see I echoed 1,000 into Proxys VM in our huge pages, and it put 500 in each one. But then on, I, sh I reclaim all of them, and then I echo a thousand into the node-specific uh, in our huge pages, and then when I do a cat of the huge pages, all of one thousand of them went to the uh, to the zeroth node. So <coughs> once again, this is for, this is used for um, database performance. It's used to if you want to pin a database to a NUMA node or a set of NUMA nodes, you would lay out the, the Huge pages in that, that pack. And this is, this is what you'll see in the TuneD profile, so if you want to mess around with that, you can. Um, and this is just basically that, that you can do the same thing with one gigabyte huge pages. In RHEL 7 and 8, you can act, it's dynamic. You can actually um, do it on the fly, whereas in RHEL, um, earlier versions of RHEL, you have, if you allocated one gigabyte huge pages, you needed to reboot the system in order to get them back. That's no longer true with RHEL 7 and 8. However, if you, um, if you think you're going to run you know, this big application and suck all the memory down and think that it's going to be able to get the, uh, the <coughs> one, one gigabyte huge pages even easily, it's, it's probably not going to be able to because it's, the, the memory will be fragmented enough. So, if you're going to run something like this, it needs to be done fairly soon after boot before you run a bunch of applications so that it won't suck all the memory down before trying to use them. So this is the, um, this, I did the same thing here. I showed how to use the one gigabyte um, huge pages on a per node basis versus a system-wide basis and how you can, you can get the, uh, excuse me, you can, you can control the system and tell it to allocate the huge pages from a certain node. And once again, the reason I'm going over th this is what the TuneD profiles are all made up of. This is what you need to sort of understand if you're going to do some tuning. <coughs> <It's coughs> Excuse me. This is the uh, performance. This just gives you an idea of how much of a performance boost you'll get on using huge pages. One gig by huge pages, <coughs> if it's dense memory, um, you, you will get a real boost in performance by using a single TLB entry. With a single TLB entry, you'll probably get the entire, I'm sorry, with a, with a TLB, you'll probably get, be able to get the entire working set of a process in the, uh, uh, in, the, in, in the TLB. If you don't, it's going to start incurring TLB misses, which can be a pathological slowdown, especially in the Intel architecture. <coughs> So the, the other part I wanted to talk to you is C, about the C groups, and this sort of, I try, I'm trying to dovetail what Wayman said here <coughs> to show you how C groups are used, how the performance um, enhancements use C groups and how you use them in order to, to bind memory in, in uh, CPUs to a, a new node. So this is, I, so I had um, a section in here on C groups V2, and I took it out only because Wayman was doing, um, I have too many slides to begin with, I took it out because Wayman was doing the same thing, and I didn't want to repeat anything, and more than that, I didn't want to say something that was completely wrong, because he's the expert on this stuff, so <laughs> I didn't want to. So anyways, in REL 6 and REL 7, they're, they're, like I said, they are sort of arcane mechanisms to set up C groups. You have to mount the C group file system and you have to go in there and then CD down and, and, and when you're down there you have to make a directory in there and that duplicates everything in the directory to a deeper level of the directory and it's a, it's, when, when if, I remember when I first saw that, I thought, 
This is the screwiest thing I've ever seen. We came up with that. But, I mean, it's, it's sort of become the de facto standard. It's no worse, I guess, than the way you tune the system anyways. It's complicated, it's, it's ugly, and it requires you really to wrap your head around how the system works. So, so and I just, this is just a simple example. I, this is old. I had a 16 gig system in my office that it's finally died in a way. But I, uh, before I threw it away, I <coughs> created a 2 gigabyte per CPU subset of this 16 gig 8 CPU system. So and this is how we did it. Numa CTL minus minus hardware to get a picture of what the system looked like. Um, uh, I mounted the C groups. Uh, I went down in there, and then under the C groups, I created my own test. I CD down into there, and then the CPU set MEMS. This is the NUMA node. So I, what I did is I said I want this CPU set to have NUMA node zeros memory, and when I did the CTL NUMA CTL minus minus hardware, NUMA node zero had CPUs zero, one, two, and three. So I I, I bound those CPUs to that. And then I, I set the limit in bytes to, to two gigabytes. And then in order to get everything running, I did an echo of dollar dollop in the task. That's what the name said, the same thing. And then, then I ran the thing. And as you can see, what happens here on this, um, what happens with this, CPU 0, 1, 2, and 3 are pegged. They're 100% utilized. Um, it, it's using, um, I, I made sure that I, cause the system to overcommit memory. So you'll see, it'll, you'll see the thing swap, even though there's abundant memory in the rest of the system. <coughs> um, so this is just a, um, like I, I, I said before, that the, um, the binding the CPUs and memory together and making sure we have, um, you, you eliminate the cross memory references can be do, done several ways, one of which is with C groups, and that's how the NUMA-D tool works. And as you can see, if I correctly do this, I, I set NUMA, I set the, the memory and the CPUs for NUMA node zero, you can see uh, what, there's, a, there's a tool that NUMA stat will tell me how many hits. And you can see I get a very high hit ratio, but if I do the opposite, I purposely shut it off and I do cross memory references, I get a very high miss ratio. So this is just a, uh, a, an illustration of how, how this is used. In, in, uh, so, anyways, that's all. Um, and I also, oops, I also measured the performance. So, uh, if it's if we did local memory accesses, I wrote this stupid little program that allocated the memory and danced the memory, and I did a time of it. It and I, I counted the number of faults and all that, you know, stuff that's it, 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 important. You can see if we if we bound it correctly, it takes 1.6 seconds. If we bound it incorrectly, it takes almost two seconds to run. So it's a, there's a significant performance enhancement in doing that. <coughs> Wayman also talked a little bit about CPU shares. The CPU shares part of the C group allows you to, uh, to consume a certain amount of CPU bandwidth for a C group. But it allows you to go above that if nobody else is using the CPU. So if, the, if no other process is using, if, so if I set the thing to, um, uh, so I, I set it to 1%. So there's, there's, the current shares, share count is 1024. If I echo 10 into there, it's only going to use 1% um, of the CPU in that system. Unless nobody else is using it. If, if nobody else is using it, it allows it to go all the way up to 100%. Um, Let's just see if there's something else I wanted to say here. Uh, so if you, if it, it, like I said, it allows it to use as much as possible, but it'll guarantee one percent. It's the minimum that it'll it'll guarantee the one percent that for that C group. And this is just a, uh, um, I think this this should have been before the previous slide. This just shows you the, how well Oracle did binding these things correct versus incorrect. Um, and then the, the other type of C groups is the quota. And this is more relevant to cloud computing, right? So if you get, you get a, in, in the cloud, somebody buys, you know, an hour of some percent of your system, 
even if nobody else is using the system, you don't want it to go beyond what he bought, it, what they paid for. So this is done via um, the, the CFS, is a period and a quota, and um, this is microseconds. So this is just like Wayman had said. This is a thousand. This is a hundred mics, and it's disabled by default. So you can have as much as you want. But in the C group, if I echo a thousand into this quota, it's going to be one percent. So Basically, 1,000 divided by 100,000 is 1%. And as you can see, when you run this, it only allows 1% of the total system CPU to be used by the C group. So that's how all of these things are used by the kernel and tuning and all the tools and so forth we do. Like I said, it takes a while to wrap your head around this and figure out how this stuff works. So, um, and then this was a, like I said, this, you would do something like this if you, in a cloud computing model in which, um, like AWS probably does this all the time, if you have, um, uh, if, if you buy, you know, 5% of, of the system's CPU resources for 20 minutes, it's that C group that, that actually restricts it and prevents it from hogging up more. If you want to pay more, you can probably um, use the other, um, the, uh, what was the, other one? The, the other C group, and then uh, the, I forgot what the name of it is. I'm having a senior moment here. The shares, you can use the shares, but they would, pay, you would, they would charge you more to do that because there's more computing resources that you're using. So, um, and the last thing, a little piece I wanted to talk about. I, so the disk I oh, this, this in these 2D profiles, there are elevators in the, uh, um, uh, there are I.O. elevator algorithms that determine the order in which stuff gets <laughs> shot out to disk. And I just, this was one of the pieces that Joe was going to go over, so I'm not going to, I think I'm going to get it on time here anyways, I'm going to spend time on something else. Um, the, the, um, so so the, the, each 2D profile selects a different um, elevator algorithm for the, for the disk I.O. So, and it's based on the type of I.O. that you want. If you want high bandwidth, if you want low latency, it, it's based on that. And this is just um, a, a, an example of, of the performance gain that is, in, that is incurred when you, when you tune the system correctly. So that basically what happens, the way that the, the write-back code, and we, we've been talking about the write-back code, the page cache uses pages of RAM to uh, cache file system data. And when you do a file system write operation, it just copies the, your contents of your data from your user buffer into the page cache and then sets, sets another dirty page in the page cache. And then once, this, once the page cache gets up to a certain level, we start spewing those pages out based on an algorithm that you choose the latency versus throughput, or the more accurately, the 2D profile chooses them. <coughs> so these are what they are, the write-back parameters, and this is what Wayman talked about in that, the write-back uh, control. controller. So there's a dirty background ratio and a dirty ratio, and there's a read-ahead parameter. I don't know, is the read-ahead parameter part of that controller or not? Not yet. It probably will be in the future. It determines how aggressively the system reads. If you go out to disk, the disk operation is obviously the most expensive part of, of sucking in the room. So, um, I just want to really quickly go over, the, these two are probably the most important parameters in the 2D profile if you are, um, if you're messing around with disk I.O., which obviously most applications do. The, the, the background ratio and the dirty background ratio, um, they control, I'll just show a picture of this. This works like the, the, dirt, the free list works. When, the, when there is, uh, um, it, when you have little or no dirty pages of page cache, we don't do anything. But once you go up and you hit the dirty background ratio, which the default is 10% currently, um, we actually wake up some background flushing threads. There's a pool of flushing, flushing threads. You wake them up and they flick pages out. And, and if you, once again, those can, there's a pool of them and you can have many more user processes in those pools. You can overwhelm them. If it overwhelms them, whelms them, you'll get up to the dirty ratio, which is 20%. At that point, it stops the process and it says you're going to become a background writer so that, so that, the, so that it's harder to overwhelm the system. <coughs> in the, uh, 
Um, the, so the, these two parameters really directly control latency versus throughput. If you, if you increase these two parameters really high, the system's not going to do anything until it, there's a whole bunch of dirty page cache memory. Dirty page cache memory gets written back several different ways. There's a, what, the old equivalent of the units update game and runs in the background. It runs every five seconds and flips out pages that are 30 seconds old. It's pretty, it's pretty arcane in today's performance and, and speed operations, but it's still there. So if you, if you were just normally using your system, you're not overwhelming, the, the, you're not overwhelming it. Um, then you'll stay down below the dirty background ratio. In the, in the update daemon will flip pages out. If you throw a bigger workload at it, you'll go above it, and then it'll manually wake up the background writing threads. And if you go even further, it'll take every process and turn it into a background writer. And then just the kernel, uh, the rel kernel features that you'll see. Um, PML5, five, five, the five level page table support is in rel um, So the current, uh, Intel, I shouldn't say Intel, x86-64 architecture, the current one has four levels. It has a page directory, a page upper directory, middle directory, and page table. And that allows you to, that allows, um, that al if you do the arithmetic, it allows uh, two to the 47th bits of user space and two to the 47th bits of kernel space. So 128 terabytes of virtual space. And then the kernel space is broken in half the Unity mapping window, which is 2 to the 46, which is the 64 gig. That's where the limit of the 64 gig memory comes into with the, uh, the four-level page table. So we have the five-level page table. It's off by default because unless you have, unless you either have so much memory that you need to map more than 64 terabytes or you need more than 128 terabytes of user space, Turning it on would be a performance impact. I don't know how much of a performance impact. We don't know that yet. But, but turning it on would, uh, would impact the performance because the TLB mishandling code now has to lock an additional level in the page table. It has to dereference more memory locations, and it's going to run slower. The other thing is C group V2. I'm not going to say anything more because Wayne talked about that. Um, memory mode, uh, dim, any dim support. This is something fairly fairly recent that is in uh, the upstream kernel too. It, um, it uses, it, it, it's an option to allow you to use NVDIMs for RAM, but because they're slower than DRAM, it uses the system's DRAM to cache the contents of the NVDIM memory. <coughs> so it, uh, um, it we, we, we're just starting to wrap our heads around the performance consequences of, of something like this. It's, it's very, it's just as fast as DRAM unless you overcommit the nodes DRAM, so, so unless you overcommit that cache. Once you overcommit the cache, it's in the direct map physical caching scheme, and you, there's a performance curve you fall off. I've measured some of that and seen some numbers. I can't talk about numbers, or, or I'm not prepared to talk about any numbers here because I don't know that what I did for performance monitoring and measuring is correct yet. I just wrote a simple program understanding how this, this hardware works and how the kernel uses it. And, and so I'm not prepared to talk about that. Two megabyte uh, huge pages in the page cache. This allows um, file system pages to be, to be two megabytes instead of four kilobytes. And then the kernel address space randomization. Um, we've gone through a, a bunch of uh, security nightmares over the past year or two. And you know, there's, there's so many ways that you can crack into a system. I think this address space randomization is, is an admission of, of not knowing how to fix it. So if you just basically shuffle the deck every time you boot the kernel, then you won't be able to wrap your head around where in memory certain kernel data structures lie or certain subroutines lie or anything, because it's going to be different every time you boot it. So, so that's some of the features that is in um, Rel8. And then some performance white papers that I, most of them are from last year, but there's a couple of new ones in there. So, um, oh yeah, sure. I think he's going to make this, somebody took the presentation, they're going to make it available. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's it. I mean, that's all I have to say. I don't know. 
it's hard to <coughs> describe some of this stuff in 50 minutes. It just, it's just, it's complicated, it's messy. Um, it's, uh, I tried to explain how the kernel and the tuning mechanisms are used, how they use the, the various features, including CPUs and all that. I hope it was of some use.